Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Shiva Mittal, and I have a pleasure to speak in front of you uh, on advanced Parkinson's disease management. I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, on this very, very important topic. So I will start with a very basic slide uh, on advanced Parkinson's disease and uh, take you through the journey of Parkinson's disease patients. This is a huge, a very vast topic. So 30 minutes, uh, uh, it's very difficult to finish the talk in 30 minutes, but we'll try my level best. So Dr. Poonami already talked about early Parkinson's disease, the pre-motor symptoms, the early Parkinson's, and then you have the advanced Parkinson's disease. When we have the motor features of slowness in movement, stiffness in the muscles and tremor, we call that as Parkinson's disease, Parkinsonism, we start the phase of early Parkinson's. And this gradually progresses over the years. And we see the late stage of the, these symptoms such as falls, balance issues, swallowing difficulties, gait freezing. And you have the treatment. You start them with patients on levodopa medications and other dopamine agonists, other medications. And you see some complications from the medications with the overall, uh, the, the, the long-term condition and you see the symptoms of fluctuations, dyskinesias, freezing episodes. And uh, this is what we call as complications or dyskinesias related to levodopa medication. And this is uh, an advanced stage. It leads to psychosis, visual hallucinations, and other big problems, which are very difficult to manage in day-to-day -day life. On top of these motor features, we always have underlying non-motor symptoms, which play a crucial role in quality of life of these patients, which are symptoms of constipation, anosmia, REM behavior disorder, fatigue, memory problems, bladder symptoms, and I will come to that in details in, last, in one of the last slides. When we start the treatment with, for Parkinson's disease patients, uh, we start with a variety of medications, including MAO-B inhibitors, uh, dopamine agonists, levodopa medications. And as time passes by, we have to have more and more medications to manage their symptoms. And you can see in this area that there are many medications which we have to play with to help control the symptoms uh, with advanced Parkinson's disease. So, I usually say that when, the, when you start the medication, the patient respond very well. And that is a honeymoon phase where the patients are doing excellent. And after four or five years or after seven to 10 years, depending on their progression rate, you see that they start developing complications, fluctuations and other symptoms. And you have to do really um, manage with multiple medications or cut down the medications to uh, have a better quality of life for the patients. These are the motor fluctuations that we usually deal in a day-to-day -day practice, mostly with dyskinesias, wearing off, unpredictable on and off when the patient takes a medicine, the dose doesn't kick in. And uh, many times the patient will tell that after I take the medicine and as the medication is wearing off, I have worsening of my tremor. Uh, patients will commonly have non-motor fluctuations as well. And uh, sometimes a patient can have, can have peak dose akinesia. This is a um, review article where they uh, looked at their patient's sample size and they found the most common um, uh, fluctuations was actually the peak dose dyskinesia, but we see biphasic off period and multiple types of fluctuations. Uh, this is a diagram representing the uh, journey of Parkinson's patient starting in the initial four years, we see a good years or the honeymoon phase I was talking about. Then after four to five years, we develop, patients develop uh, motor fluctuations, and then you develop uh, unpredictable off fluctuations or uh, uh, dose failures, and things become complicated as patients uh, approach advanced Parkinson's disease or late Parkinson's disease. This is a, a, a good way to judge how the levodopa is working for the patient. And uh, uh, we classify as like stages in stage five. Stage one is a uh, patient is not aware of any effect of the individual dose. So they are doing very well throughout the day. They don't feel any on and off. And second stage is they feel in the afternoon, they're losing effect, mostly because of lack of absorption, because of heavy protein meal uh, that can interfere with the absorption of the medication. And 
loss of sleep benefit, early morning akinesia, foot dystonia. These are other off-state symptoms. And then the patients develop the classical varying of motor fluctuations and uh, abrupt on and off unpredictable dose response. And these are the different stages. Non-motor symptoms are very important. When we talk about, um, when we talk to our patients with regards to how is your tremor, stiffness, slowness, we ha also have to ask about how's the mood, anxiety, um, any low mood symptoms, feeling any uh, panic attacks, uh, tired, um, lack of uh, like too much sweating um, or uh, flushing episodes. Uh, many times in the off phase, patients will have more bladder symptoms and they do better when the liver dopa is working better. Uh, dysphagia is also a very common symptom that you can see uh, becoming worse in the off state and responds quite well to the uh, liver dopa medication. Pain is the other symptom which responds quite well if it's related to Parkinson's disease uh, condition and uh, easy way to say that pain is because of Parkinson's or uh, something other cause is uh, looking at the response with the levodopa medication. And uh, the most common reason for these fluctuations, uh, we know that uh, there are like this, there's a peripheral cause and central cause. I will not go into the details, but the most important discussion here will be the the gastric absorption, that's a key for what we can do clinically uh, in our, uh, how to manage these patients better. We know there's a delayed gastric emptying and uh, there's a lack of absorption and how we can optimize the liver dopa absorption as it reaches the brain to provide a sustained supply to have a continuous uh, dopaminergic uh, uh, therapy. And, um, you can see this is a very interesting photograph where it's a gastric mucosa. Uh, so this patient was scheduled for a duopa pump and the uh, uh, patient took a cinemet, uh, levodopa, carbidopa medication two hours before the procedure. And the patient still had uh, the cinemet lying uh, undissolved in the gastric, uh, in the pylorus region. And, um, uh, and the actual absorption takes place in the small intestine. So it still has a long way to go. And you can see that's why the patient has no response. He already waited for two hours. So this delayed gastric emptying plays a major role in uh, uh, and it, uh, causing uh, motor fluctuations in advanced Parkinson's disease patients. So what are the different ways that we can work around the stomach? Uh, you can give the medication in liquid formulation. You can give a transdermal patch. You can give a subcutaneous injection. You can give... Uh, you can uh, put a tube directly to the small intestine and uh, deliver uh, the medications through that. Or you can do a more central action like a deep brain stimulation. So there are several ways that you can work around. And this, this, uh, this cartoon uh, depicts very well what are the different options that are available for treatment of advanced Parkinson's disease patients. Now coming to um, uh, the levodopa, uh, Dr. Poonami already mentioned about the uh, treatment options for Parkinson's disease mm -hmm. and uh, very effective treatment is the uh, cinemet or the levodopa carbidopa or in uh, UK Germany we have uh, medopar which is uh, levodopa and benzerizide and the, the uh, we know that with over the years after four or five years the patients start having fluctuations they can have dyskinesias or they can have wearing off and in that state you need to find out some other way to extend the effect of the medication we do have Stalivo, which is a combination of Cinemet along with uh, Entecapone or Comte inhibitors, but we know that uh, it is not always helpful and we need something else to help, them con to help them to control the symptoms better. The new formulations coming up like the accordion pill where the medication is folded into um, um, uh, sheets and it is inside a capsule. So it, it is released in a slow fashion. And then there is a, a subcutaneous levodopa, carbidopa coming in future. And uh, we also have the inhaled levodopa inhalation, which is called the Inbringer. And uh, we have a longer acting COMT inhibitors, which is called Opicapon or Gentis. We have a newer Maobi inhibitor, which uh, with, with extra glutaminergic action, which is a Zerago or Safinamide. Uh, there's a, a, a sublingual epimorphine, which is coming into action soon. And uh, there are many medications which are coming on the way. Um, and uh, I think we are so desperate at this point uh, 
uh, when uh, we see the patients in the clinic that any option that can improve the quality of life or can improve the off phase and uh, uh, it should be used as soon as possible. So uh, these are the new options coming up and some options which are already available. Now coming to this very important concept of continuous dopaminergic stimulation. And uh, uh, the main three therapies are deep brain stimulation, the duopa pump and the epimorphine pump. First talking about deep brain stimulation and uh, many people, I think most of the neurologists are aware of uh, deep brain stimulation. And uh, because this has been there for more than two decades, uh, we have gotten better in the, uh, um, in the therapy for DBS. We know in and out what are the complications to look out for, what are the ways we can do uh, for the programming to improve the symptoms. And we also know when not to do DBS, that is a very important concept. So whenever we see a patient with Parkinson's and we think about DBS, the first three things are, is the patient really eligible for DBS? And uh, if yes, then, other patient, then the patient needs a lot of further investigation, such as neuropsych testing, uh, uh, physical therapy evaluation, speech therapy evaluation, a lot of counseling before we really go for the DBS surgery, because it is a commitment and the symptoms that improves with DBS, as we are aware, are the tremor, the bradykinesia, rigidity, dyskinesia, and the motor fluctuations. The symptoms which do not get better from DBS are the swallowing difficulties, the balance issues, the cognitive dysfunction, and this autonomia. It is very important because uh, this is a very common question asked in the clinic that, uh, doctor, I'm having a lot of falls and uh, I'm having a lot of memory issues or my blood pressure is falling too much when I'm standing, will this get better with DBS? The answer is no. If I see a patient who is uh, having all of these symptoms, I would certainly take off the list from the DBS and do with medical management or the pump therapies to help their symptom control. The targets for DBS is subthalamic nucleus and globus pallidus internal. And uh, this was a landmark study, uh, initial study, where they found DBS was helpful in Parkinson's disease patients. And uh, you can see here in this uh, column that uh, the number of hours improved, uh, with, which was the on phase without dyskinesia from three to 7.6 hours. Um, the sleeping was much better. Um, the immobile state was better significantly, it reduced. So these are some significant changes that um, the study proved. Also the other things like quality of life, emotional well-being, stigma, cognition, these all symptoms had a good improvement, uh, but most of the motor symptoms were having, showed a drastic improvement after DBS. DBS always, we have to look at a, as, at a patient as a team approach. It ha there has to be a movement disorder neurologist 24 seven available for the patient. That has to be a functional neurosurgeon who is in house for any troubleshoot. You should have a psychologist, psychiatrist, anesthesia trained in DBS surgery, speech therapist trained in LSVT therapies, physical therapy as well. Set up for DBS. And these are different devices which are available. We have three companies, which is Boston Scientific, Boston, uh, St. Jude Abbott, and uh, Medtronic. And we have all the programmers which are available. The uh, Medtronic recently came with a new programmer, which is available as well. And so that's DBS. We'll come to some patients uh, in, at the end of the talk, uh, but I want to discuss all the advanced therapies first. The second therapy I talk to all my patients and we must know about this is the Duopa pump. Duopa pump is uh, uh, innovative, is a very uh, uh, natural way of giving uh, dopamine to the body. So there is a, a pump which is, uh, uh, attached to a cartridge. And this cartridge has a liquid levodopa and uh, in a gel form and not liquid, but in gel form. And this is attached to a tube. The patient has a peg tube inside and through the peg tube, there's a further connection, which is goes down to the J, jejunum. So we have a peg J tube. And through this tube, uh, the, the gel form of levodopa is transfused continuously 
during the daytime. And uh, the absorption is direct to the small intestine. It is very fast absorption. The hope is that the fluctuations will be better. Again, we have not reached that stage with any advanced therapies that we are 100% sure that the, the, the curve will be flat. We will not see fluctuations, but again, uh, there's still scope for improvement. And this is the closest that we can get at this point. Uh, this is a study, initial study from uh, uh, Cleveland Clinic, Ohio group and uh, with a multicentric trial. Uh, and uh, they, they showed that uh, there was, uh, um, you know, significant improvement by 4.8 hours. You can see there's improvement in on time and reduction of off phase by four hours. What's remarkable is around 92% patients had problems with the pump and around 35% patients had complication with the device insertion because it's a PEG-J tube and uh, it, it becomes a hassle for these patients because of abdominal pain, procedural pain, nausea, post-operative granulation tissue or secretion. So you need to have a gastroenterologist who is really involved uh, to follow up with these patients as well. This is the results of the multicenter clinical trial where they found the two hours on was increased and two hours off was improved. Uh, these are the other long-term um, studies. They have found that around 41% patients have complications with the device insertion. Around 36% patients have abdominal pain. Um, so you need to tell this to our patients uh, uh, and uh, they should be aware that uh, these are the common complications. These are very common. Anything more than 10% is common. If you say 41% patients will have device complications or insertions, they should be aware of that. So they are ready. And we have a gastroenterologist identified who can take care of this if needed. And this is uh, another slide where uh, they've summarized and we can see 54% required uh, digital tube replacement. Uh, that's also a big thing for the DOPA pump. Now coming to the third option, which is the epimorphine pump. And uh, coming to epimorphine, uh, epimorphine is one of the oldest medications actually. It's a dopamine agonist and it, it works as good as levodopa cinnamate. Uh, this is uh, one of the fastest acting and the most potent uh, dopamine agonist. And um, uh, we, its use was limited because of the nausea side effects. Now with this formulation, um, I think we can get away with that uh, with some uh, priming of the uh, priming with some uh, prokinetic drugs like uh, 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 Domperidone that really helps for the first few days when you give this medication. And uh, epimorphine uh, can be given by uh, like injection, like a subcutaneous uh, needle, like an insulin uh, needle. It can be also given as a continuous subcutaneous infusion. Uh, which is called the epimorphine pump or epogo pump or demine pump. There are two companies which make it, or maybe there are more companies. Um, and uh, the way the epimorphine pen works, it works very quickly. Uh, the absorption is much faster. It's more reliable. And the side effects are mostly yawning, uh, sleepiness, nausea is a very common side effect with uh, epimorphine. Now the epimorphine pump infusion uh, was uh, was proven with the study Toledo trial where they had 53 patients and they found significant improvement in the on on phase and the off phase and uh, overall the dyskinesias were much better. The common adverse events you can see is mostly when you put the injection is an infusion site you can develop nodules you can some develop some erythema so that is something to be um, to to observe and ask the patient to switch from one side to the other side or different location to avoid the skin induration. Nausea is a common side effect, but usually it goes away with time. Also, you have to treat the patients with domperidone for the first few days so that the nausea uh, gets better. Now, the question is which therapy uh, you should choose uh, for our patient? So if we have a younger patient who has a lot of tremor, a lot of motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, uh, the best option will be DBS. If the patient has uh, depression, psychosis, mild dementia, then you start thinking about levodopa pump or the epimorphine pump. Uh, if the patient has uh, contraindications for brain surgery, definitely you have to think about the pump therapies. 
if the patient has history of abdominal surgery, has contraindications to abdominal surgery, we don't have dual pump, pump as an option. You go with the epigo pump. If the patient has very bothersome dyskinesias to dopamine therapy, we know that uh, dopa pump will not work. DBS is the best option, or maybe we can try epimorphine pump as well. Now, this is just a, a summary that you can uh, make a note that um, uh, every patient who is younger patient who has a lot of tremor, uh, motor fluctuations, dyskinesias, think about DBS. The patient should not have significant cognitive uh, psychological issues, uh, should not have any falls um, in the on phase, or should still have a good posture control. These are some symptoms and signs you should always look out for, for patients uh, going for DBS surgery. Duopa pump, epimorphine pump, uh, mostly elderly, frail patients who cannot get DBS surgeries, um, and it works very well. I would say that epimorphine pump and duopa pump are excellent treatment options for the patients who cannot get DBS. And uh, mostly it gets difficult when you tell the patient about the PEG tube and the PEG J insertion, uh, they get a bit uh, anxious because no one wants a tube or uh, a gastrostomy. Uh, but uh, again, you have to tell them there's a natural way of giving dopamine uh, directly into the intestine. And um, you know, I, I think it's, it's a great option for advanced Parkinson's disease patients. And so epimorphine works subcutaneously. So it is much easier than the duopa pump. Now we'll go through some examples. Uh, you, uh, you're in your clinic and you see a 65 year old uh, male who has 14 years history of Parkinson's disease. And he mentions that he, is, he was doing very well for the past many years, but in the past six months to one year, he is noticing that he is having fluctuations. In the afternoon time, he takes food and he does not have any effect of the medication. He is having wearing off. And he also has uh, some dyskinesias, which his family has noted, but he is not concerned about it. And uh, so you realize this patient is edging from early Parkinson's towards uh, uh, advanced Parkinson's disease with motor fluctuations at this point. There are dyskinesias, there are off states, and then you optimize the medication. You tell the patient to take medicine on empty stomach for better absorption. You can add uh, entecapone, you can switch cinemic to Stelevo. Uh, you can add uh, dopamine agonist, uh, long acting. Uh, you can consider adding uh, medi medication like safinamide, or if you have OP capone, you can consider that. Uh, these are the various options that you can consider uh, in this patient. Uh, so this is what the patient is having. What I usually ask my patients to make a diary of the symptoms and they can time it. And we know when the medicine is working or when the medicine is not working. And you can see clearly that the patient took his medication at 8 a.m., 12 p.m., 4 p.m., and 8 p.m. And you can see that at 12 p.m., there is no effect of the medicine because there's a dose failure. The dose failure is likely because he had lunch at noon and that affects the absorption and he's having more fall during this time. In the evening, he is having too much medication and he's having dyskinesia. So that is something to look into. Now coming to a patient who has a, a tremor, uh, who is an elderly man, around 58 year old, who has a lot of tremor for past six years. He takes high dose of dopamine medications, but he, his tremor is not under control. So what option would you consider in this patient? We can go with DBS, we can go with focused ultrasound ablation, or we can do Botox treatment for hand tremor. So this patient went, DB, went for DBS uh, at a Cleveland Clinic. Abu Dhabi. You can see this is the intro of video. So you can see the tremor of his right hand while he is holding the cup. While we do the stimulation, the patient is awake during the surgery and uh, we can monitor behind the uh, plastic is uh, Dr. Tanmoy, who is a functional neurosurgeon. And that's me and the interpreter standing on this side. And with the stimulation on, you can see that the tremor subsides. So we know the target is right and we proceed with, the, with closing the DBS lead. This is the, uh, in the clinic, uh, his uh, programming. So this is the DBS is off right now. Hold your hands up like You this. can see a lot of tremor in his hands. So the re-emergent tremor, and then here's a right hand uh, rest tremor. 
a lot of bradykinesia and you can see the right leg tremor coming up now. Now this is after the device was switched on. Keep your feet in the forward. So he's counting. And you can see the tremor is very nicely controlled uh, with the uh, stimulation. So other option is botulinum toxin injection. So this is the only randomized double blind placebo control study that uh, uh, we did uh, when I was uh, um, uh, in US uh, at Yale University. And um, uh, this is uh, it's a very good study where you find uh, that bottom toxin can be offered to the patients who have refractory rest tremor, which doesn't respond to levodopa medications and who cannot go for DBS surgery. So you can look at this uh, video where this patient had a prominent tremor and uh, he got Botox injection in his right hand. And you can see the tremor is better now. And this is three weeks, three months follow where you can see the tremor is coming back. So we know that uh, the Botox works only for three months and the effect wears off after that. This is another patient who's around 85 year old man who has a prominent left hand rest tremor with tremor dominant Parkinson's disease. And this is after the bottom toxin injection, you can see the left hand tremor is under significant control. It's not 100%, but it is much better. I'm asking him to count backwards. And now you can see the left hand tremor starts surfacing. Uh, you can also use polyproxin for pizza syndrome where you have truncal flexion towards one side. And okay, now another case we'll discuss. So this patient is a young man who has a young onset Parkinson's disease. He has Parkinson's for the past 10 years. His chief complaint is right hand rest tremor. And uh, when he takes a medicine, even 50 milligram of levodopa, he has severe dyskinesias. So this is his off state when he did not take any medication. You can see prominent right hand rest tremor, prominent bradykinesia with the right upper limb. I know it is difficult. And they it's difficult for him, and then he's a prominent rest tremor. He is reading Quran. That helps him to uh, bring out the tremor to concentrate more. Postural tremor as well. Gait. You can see right hand uh, resting tremor. And now this is when you took the medication so after levodopa you can see he has prominent dyskinesia in right upper limb and right lower limb. You can see prominent dyskinesia there. So you can see a prominent rest tremor in this video and dyskinesia in this video. So he would always swing between the two phases and he had no phase where he, the tremor is under control or dyskinesia is under control. Uh, for him, the option includes only DBS surgery because we cannot do epimorphine pump or duopa pump because he is so young and he has severe dyskinesia. So he would have the same dyskinesia with other two options as well. So the only option for him was DB, deep brain stimulation. In the OR, you can see that he has prominent right hand and right leg rest tremor. I'll make it, uh, I forward the video a bit. You can see I'm asking him to. I forward, I'm not sure. Hey, hold, hold it up. Yeah. Act as if you're drinking water. How can I get this from my mm -hmm. uh, Now bring it out for me. This is. Right, but it's 
So he cracks it. Not my fear. Now? Not my He drank a lot of water. <laughs> now this is in the programming, uh, in the clinic visit when we are doing the DBS programming for him. So we we'll switch the DBS device. Make the perfect settings. Very good. You can see the thermal is under very good control. This walking is not proper. So this is same, uh, same patient but different video, different day of programming. Okay. Now we come to the next case, where this is a forty-nine-year-old male who has uh, Parkinson's for more than 10 years, and he takes medications uh, every two and a half to three hours. The problem with him, him is uh, when he takes the medicine, it causes severe uh, side effects, such as nausea, vomiting. He lost more than 30 kgs. And you look at him, he's very frail. Uh, and he was pretty muscular and uh, a heavy guy earlier, but he lost all his weight because of the side effects of the medication but he cannot stop the medication because he will, he is not able to move uh, without the medication. So he has to take the cinnamon every three hours. So the good option for him is only DBS because uh, the duopa pump is again, the same du du uh, dopamine and epimorphine can also cause a lot of nausea side effect as well. So uh, we did a levodopa challenge. You can see a significant improvement uh, in his UPDR score from 39 to six and he had a DBS done and he is doing very well. Uh, we have cut down his medication by 75% and uh, he is 85% better or he is just taking medicine because he feels a need to take it. Otherwise his motor symptoms are all under good control. That's his uh, DPS leads. Now, other patient we'll talk about is, so we're done with the DBS now, we'll move to the pump therapies uh, with some patient examples here. Uh, Elderly man with prominent motor fluctuations comes to your clinic. He says, so this patient already had DBS done around 15 years ago. And uh, he comes to see me and he says that he has prominent gait freezing. Uh, he takes a levodopa cinnamon, even two tablets, three tablets. There is no improvement in the gait. And um, what do we do at this point? I made a lot of changes in the DBS, but the gait freezing is something which is not getting better. His overall upper limb appendicular symptoms are all under control, good tone, no tremor control, uh, doing very well with that regards, but uh, mostly with the uh, uh, gait freezing is a big problem. So we did an epimorphine response test. So you can see this video where he is having significant shuffling of gait, uh, gait freezing, not able to lift his leg up, um, walking very slowly. He had a lot of falls because of the freezing. Uh, one trick is to always try for visual cues in this patient and see they improve or not. So you can see he can take a step very easily after you keep a pen in front of his foot. So that is a visual cues for gait freezing. And we did an epimorphin response test and you can see that now he is very quick to stand up and he is able to walk so well. The gait freezing just improved significantly. So he now got his epimorphine pump and he is doing well. So other way, we'll discuss another case where we have advanced Parkinson's with motor fluctuations, a 70 year old man with a 15 year history of Parkinson's and uh, uh, he is referred for tremor in his hands. He had uh, a lot of dyskinesias and then wearing off and uh, he developed uh, um, no, he had severe off and on freezing as a major cause for falls. And uh, the fall was a major con concern for this patient. And the many options that we can do uh, for these patients with motor fluctuations, we know he is elderly, we cannot do DBS. 
we know that he is having a lot of falls and balance issues. So best option for him will be something like uh, Duopa pump uh, or epimorphine pump, depending on the response test, how much he improves with that. So this is something that we should always consider uh, in advanced Parkinson's disease patients. Now, this is uh, something which we see very often in our uh, busy movement disorders clinic, which is um, patients coming with more than 10, 15 years of history of Parkinson's disease, elderly people, they have hallucinations, sleepiness, leg edema, irritability, falls, freezing of gait, bladder frequency, urgency, severe constipation, a lot of symptoms. And at that point, you look at the polypharmacy, what medications they are on. Are they taking chemedrin? Are they on anticholinergics? Uh, any uh, anti, um, anti neuroleptics medications, uh, prokinetic agents, all these have to be looked into. Uh, symptomatic management of non motor symptoms is very crucial in these patients. Looking at REM behavior disorder, fragmented sleep, vivid dreams, excessive daytime sleepiness, restless leg syndrome, dementia, depression, anxiety symptoms, apathy, orthostatic hypotension, siluria, constipation, erectile dysfunction hallucination, psychosis, impulse control disorders, and many more. So it takes at least uh, one hour to review all these symptoms and go through their history for any new patient with Parkinson's. And I think it's follow-up, it never becomes shorter. It always becomes longer because their symptoms changes with time and you always have to understand and have to go slow with these patients and the families. They're already, dealing a dealing, they're already going through a lot um, uh, with these patients. This is a recent publication that we had uh, in collaboration with the uh, University of Washington and Mayo Clinic, where we have uh, summarized all the perioperative management of Parkinson's disease patients. This is commonly that I see uh, mostly in uh, UAE as well, that uh, Parkinson's patients, when they get admitted anywhere in the hospital, they have a lot of issues in management of their medications. They will have hallucinations, delirium, infections, pneumonia, aspiration, things like that. So this is a good paper to have a look. If you don't find it, you can send me a, you can contact me. I will be happy to send you a copy of the paper. I don't think we have time for this bonus case. And uh, uh, this is our team and uh, I'm thankful to my team. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Monsi with me as a movement disorder neurologist, uh, Dr. Tatarmoy Maithi and his colleague, uh, Dr. Carlos in functional neurosurgery team. We have a neuropsychologist, we have a psychologist and uh, a psychiatrist. A uh, wonderful team of uh, rehab spe specialists we have. And um, um, Parkinson's management is not a single person show. It has to be a team effort. And I'm thankful to everybody along with my nurses and support staff. Thank you.